So I'm giving black men today and tomorrow opportunities to be heard. Even if this is the first time in your life ever, you'll get a chance to allow your thoughts to be depicted in a way that's positive, that gives you more ability. You never get that in your life. Uh, you know, being the former therapist, I know what it is for us who don't get that in life. So it's kind of like, I just want to do a small window that hopefully allows a lot of life. How has being a black man positively or negatively affected my life? Being a black man has definitely positively impacted me because it, it gives me that drive. That's a pretty loaded question, but uh, I'll definitely have to say it positively affected my life because uh, it placed upon me a major responsibility to impact the world. I know who I am and whose I am. Um, and knowing that is definitely a positive to me. Um, it gives me a sense of pride and I feel proud of being a black man. Being black, has gave me um, a really strong sense of pride in who I am, my community, um, our culture, um, being a father. Uh, the positive outcome is that people were before us, that stood before us, was will let us know that the next generation, you need to be proud of who you are, no matter what the cost or the situation is. Proud that you're a black man, stand up for yourself, stand up for your family, your community. To see men like me, to see their mind create these new realities uh, when it comes to, you know, how far you can truly go in life, it has impacted me in a positive way. It's like a sense of motivation, like, ooh, like, he looks like me. He, you know, talks like me. His his mind is has evolved like mine. It's like, it's a sense of motivation, and, you know, and inspiration that, ooh, how high can I go? How far can I go? If I truly put value behind my every thought as a black man, you know, I am setting the new culture. I am setting I am setting the new normal for us black men and from future black men, you know, to grow into. I'm Dr. Herman Pryor Jr. I am a uh, former therapist. I'm also a national certified counselor uh, based here in the Washington, D.C. area. Also the founder of a small business coaching consulting firm here in D.C. called Hip Enterprise LLC. Sound Off primarily was a, a war cry for me. Um, started back about Father's Day 2019. Um, in a basic conversation with my wife, uh, she was talking about literally um, women and what women have been through and I don't know whether it was just me being close to Father's Day and being a father, a new father and feeling the heat and pressure of hearing about um, our sisters and what they've been through and you know wanting to find ways and peace to promote that at the same time trying to sit with what I was feeling and what I was feeling was something internal um, again being a father, a new father and also being a black man I immediately started feeling that uh, there was a lack. Um, I couldn't even explain the lack. It was a lack of whether we as black men had enough uh, promotion of voice, self-awareness, and placement You know, in today's time. With this project, my goal was to be a beacon um, in 2019 for black men by lifting some of those voices and bringing it to front and center. I think a lot of times, um, as a former therapist myself, it's, it's become our cliche, uh, which it should be, for us to promote uh, wellness, mental wellness for, for black men in America um, by having that be a first step, you know, having a conversation about what it means to think for yourself internally and externally, apply that, that action and knowledge to power. And so with therapy being a source, I think it's much more crucial for um, the depiction of the different type of black men that are out there and the way we think and the levels that we operate um, instead of being um, grouped and piled together throughout generation um, I thought there was beauty in being able to discern and decipher and depict the different flavors 
of brothers that exist in, in the world today. And so I think in having diversity, uh, even within the race, be authentic, you get the best and the most accurate depiction of what we're going through. I didn't want necessarily um, the same type of brother, you know, who was perceived to have made it to what's perceived to can speak the best or speak the most affluent to have it all figured out. Um, and at the same time, I didn't want the most detrimental brother who might be going through some mental problems or who might have just got released from prison. You know, I didn't want one type because that's not who we are. I think we've been dealing with that in this world, in this country for so long of being stereotyped to the point of a fault. I use the analogy of like sitting around a group of black men, standing around a group of black men on the corner, trying to talk about what we're going to go for lunch or something like that, and already being stereotyped as what, are, what is the huddle about? You know, what are they doing? You know, what are they plotting and planning to the point maybe the police getting called on us? Mm -hmm. So I think when you can take that depiction from the outside, just from that example that I gave and bring it internally and really put it on front street, that's what matters. I think the world knows it, but we have to do more of this about showcasing it because if, if without that lesson, we keep going backwards. You know, there are several types of black men out there going through so many different things and no one story is the same. So as black men, and this is a loaded question, how do you define manhood? Okay, so being a black man in 2019 means to me that, um, you know, again, I think about my ancestors, um, so my family members, my mother, grandmother, and all of those who came before us. Um, a lot of the issues that we're experiencing today um, be it with uh, police, government, whatever, financial, economical issues, they've, um, they went through a lot more. And so they went through a lot more, they sacrificed, um, they struggled, they um, it was triumph. And so it means to me that I'm, I'm supposed to understand all that and, you know, sort of take that understanding into any challenge that I actually face so I can, um, you know, be better for the next generation. So, oh uh, man, it's, it's scary by far. Um, it means holding up a mantle um, that we're, so, we're supposed to hold the world in our on our backs, and we're supposed to show the world who we really are, not just from our ancestors, but who we really are outside of the negative personas that you know the media is showing us to be. So it's like we are the we're, we are the only representation left to show what a real good black man. It's supposed to be in this in this generation, mm -hmm. and it's like every time we stand tall with the world on our shoulders, it's like we get knocked off mm -hmm. day after day with something new, something that we can't control or something like that. It feels like uh, just confusion, you know. Um, I think we historically have always been misunderstood, and I see like a lot of alarming things in society that affect a lot of people, but. Um, to be a black man is always going to affect us a hundred times more. It's going to affect us more than black women, uh, white women, uh, any other uh, race or gender combination. Um, there, there's so many things that are emerging that we don't have control of and, and lack of leadership. And I think that all these things, um, if we don't pay attention to it, um, we're in bad shape. It means so many different things to me. Uh, it means that I must work extra hard, prove myself for my family and my purpose. It means uh, excitement, it means fear, it means doubt, it means hope. First, I want to say it's an obstacle mm -hmm. for the simple fact that uh, we're just being black, basically. Uh, what it means to me is more of a, I have to say, of today as far as like, Empowerment, I think we have to stand on our own two feet. Most of us don't do that because, quote unquote, media and, you know, newscasters always gun down, you know, Black Lives Matter, stuff like that. So, in a sense, it's, I say it's, we're kind of more of a variable. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, everything is based off statistics how, oh, black men should be this way or they have an attitude or. Just be like, everything is negative when all reality is like you don't really know the black man unless you really spend one long, one long time with him, basically. Mm -hmm. To me, actually, I think it means hope. I think it means progress. Mm -hmm. I think 
it represents an amazing opportunity that I have and that we have as black men to enact change, to change people's perspective, to change the world. Uh, I'm a glass half full kind of per, kind of guy, and so I take that perspective with me um, in everyday life. And surely, because being a black man is the only person I know how to be, and the only person I have been, and the only person that I will be, I choose to look at being a black man as a positive thing. I choose to look at it again as an opportunity for me to go out and do something amazing, and to to change some to change uh, to change the the culture, to change the narrative, to change society. And so, again, for me, I look at it as a positive thing. I look at it as an immense opportunity, as a blessing even, as a blessing. I, I say that with sincerity because, because, again, you know, God intended for me to be a black man. Right. And so in that, there was a purpose in this life for me as a black man. And so I look at it from that, from that divine element as well as truly being, you know, being a purpose and mission-driven um, thing for me to be a black man because he could have had me be anybody else. But he chose me to be a black man for a reason. And despite, you know, the, the negative, you know, connotations and stereotypes that have existed for black men over time, I think those things are changing from a societal perspective. And I believe this generation, the millennial generation particularly, has an immense opportunity to really push that ball forward in a dramatic way. And so I think I look at it as a, as a positive thing, just off the strength of my, who I am as a person and how I like to process things. But secondly, just based upon when I was born, which was obviously strategic, he could have had me been born any at any time, but he had me born in 1985 so that I could be an adult at this time in, 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 in history and be amongst other black men who I think are on the same the same mission. The guys who are down there is clearly on the same mission. Many of the, the gentlemen, you notice I said gentlemen, who I, who I come in contact with on the same mission. And surely we all have... Um, you know, opportunities for growth and development, but no less, I think, uh, from what I see, there's a there's a focus on moving this thing forward. It means uh, being further than we was before, but I'm uh, still a long way to go. Um, you know, um, honestly, just still a threat, still smart, still, um, you know, still confused, still broken, still searching you know still uh yeah, still still searching uh it means a lot just being able to kind of go against or not seem to have to follow the stereotypes or being portrayed as certain things you know um it means we're very we're very powerful just being black just uh able to be a leader and for me now in 2019 because I have two young boys just being an amazing black father mm -hmm. to raise amazing black sons for this world to see. Mm -hmm. That's a thought-provoking question mm -hmm. um, because I see uh, changes taking place but at the same time I see very much the same um, and Right now, uh, working, being fortunate enough um, to be working um, as an assistant to other black men um, that have barriers to employment, that come out of high poverty, high crime uh, environments, um, working as a service provider and a workforce development specialist. Uh, to assist individuals that have barriers to employment, um, gain jobs, gain education, um, uh, gain what it takes in order to be a part of the changes that are taking place. Um, uh, at this point, being a black man doing that um, means everything. In 2019, it's I guess it really depends on where you are in life and as far as your age and what your responsibilities are and what you have going on. Because if I think about a teenager or maybe like or like someone who's kind of young and still trying to figure it out, I mean, you have this, you have, you have social media, you have, um, you have what's going on with our current political climate with the president and, um, Everything that may be going on in the social climate, because because with social media, we I feel like we don't communicate enough. Mm -hmm. And then you think about maybe because I'm 29 going on 30, 
Um, so I've dealt so I've dealt with the social media side to Barack Obama was pretty much the the, the president for pretty much my entire adult life up until two years ago. And you think about everything that can be done and what needs to be done and what will be done. And I think I think it's a lot. Um, it's it's we're, we're we're able to do a lot more now than what we were able to do in the past. People, because we are a lot more mindful in regards to LGBTQ, to people of color, to people that may be spawn that maybe have come across the border. Um, we're we're mindful of those people now. Um, we're as um, as uh, as people of color, we're, we care about those people a little bit more than say twenty, thirty, forty, or fifty years ago. So as a black man, I think we're I think we're a little bit more empathetic. I think that um, we understand what other people are coming from and what they're going through, and at the same time, and, and at the same time, uh, we know what the climate is in regards to um, uh, careers and having kids and owning houses, things that things that we strive to have. Um, twenty or thirty years ago, maybe not be maybe not be such a huge focal point now. Mm -hmm. Less people, uh, less people now are having uh, less people now are having kids. Less people now are buying homes right. because because of um, financially financially yeah, financially it's just not the same as you could just go out and get it get your college degree go get a job. It's not that simple anymore. The price of even DC where we are now, the price to live here is is, is absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's. We we're, we're mindful in regards to everything that's going on around us, and that's and that's and that's great. But the, but then at the same time, there's a lot of growing that needs to be done when it comes to being a black man. I'm not sure, to be honest with you. Um, for me, I guess it just means in 2019, uh, it's just leading by example, um, trying to give back, trying to be uh, a. a a part of the community, um, trying to be a leader, um, large and small. Do you believe that you are uh, doing any of these that you just stated? Uh, to a certain extent, mm -hmm. there's always room for you know uh, improvement and growth, um, and I feel like I'm doing some of it. Some of it I can do better, um, but for you know me, mostly it's just just being a better man. That's where I'm starting. Start start where I'm trying to start at. Mm -hmm. um, you know, be a better man for my son, be a better man for myself, first and foremost, be a better uh, partner for my wife. Um, and from there, if I think if I can lead by uh, example in that, and then share my, uh, you know, my experience and my stories with other friends, colleagues, people younger than me, I feel like that's a powerful way to go. Um, have an open, honest dialogue with people about things that we, we think are cool or are acceptable that aren't, that we do as men. How have you defined it, man? by the experiences that we grew up from, like the exposures that we was uh, shown growing up, you know, just uh, the profile that we built from everything that we saw from the time that we knew what the difference was between a boy and a man. We began that profile of an illustration and we started putting ourselves in the illustration and that kind of formed what manhood was to us. Would you say it was a profile or a program? It's going in the sun. How do you feel or have you given them to the talk about survival as an uh, uncle, you know, about like being black in America now? It kind of sucks, man. Because nobody wants to tell their child to be a certain way around certain type of people. Mm -hmm. You know, their child as a kid, you know, they shouldn't have to worry about, oh, I gotta be a certain way, you know. Yeah, make sure you say yes, sir. Make sure you try to get out the situation, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Even though it shouldn't be no situation at all in the first place, but we know how people are kind of messed up nowadays, brainwashing, racism back in the day, all that other type of stuff. Right. So to protect them, of course, you have to say certain things. I think it's crazy as hell that we have to, but right. at the end of the day, like you want to see your child come home, it's like you want to come home, so. As black men, how many of you rely on validation of others regarding your self-worth and why? Oh, what's the question again? <laughs> There's a balance. Um, in one aspect, I do care, and I think I should care. In another aspect, I don't care. Um, and I think in the aspect that I don't care, my validation of myself is enough. Um, 
However, at the same time, you know, I'm living in a community, in a home, you know, at a job. So um, in order for me to be effective and an asset in those areas, I think that requires validation. Mm -hmm. If I could add but, to that, I think you never stop you. caring. I think as you become more self-aware, you become right. more confident in who you are, mm -hmm. you can suppress the value that someone else, someone else's opinion of you, how that had how much that matters. Yep, that's you true. never stop caring. And I think uh, that you just spoke to as well, that maturity and that growth, that development mm -hmm. allows you to be to self-validate to say, you know what, regardless of how that person feels, mm -hmm. I'm okay. Mm -hmm. But to the extent that they feel great about me, about what I what I produce or whatever, I'll feel even better. That adds a that adds a layer to it. But that ain't the, that ain't the end of it as it might have been when we were young men, and that was that was our existence was dependent upon that. Sure. Well, look around. I mean, you see, we had a black president just a few years ago. When when I was born, many people who were alive then probably said they wouldn't have seen it in their lifetime. Uh, we look at the fact that now entertainers and athletes are moving beyond that sphere. We look at the fact that uh, there are more professional black males that are doing positive things. We look at the, the, the rate of CEOs and we look at people leading organizations and being a part of being a part of positive things. Heck, we even look at uh, young men or men who were wronged by the system who maybe started out life in a, in a, in a negative light, turning it, turning it on its head. When I grew up in my environment, when I looked around, it was the hood. Yeah. You know, um, all of that was the hood. So the hood was what was norm for me, mm -hmm. you know, and which quite naturally I became hood. Um, despite the fact that I came up in a God-fearing, law-abiding household, uh, when I looked outside my house, I couldn't find anything to validate and confirm what was going on in my household. So when I see the changes today, and I look out and I, I see an art gallery on Goho Road, right? And I see all these progressive businesses, you know, taking place in the neighborhood. I feel good that a youth can look out of their homes today and see maybe um, different uh, uh, races, um, different ethnicities, uh, progressive business, business people in business attires because that that gives them another model mm -hmm. right um so I, I see that as a positive um and it kind of influences you to change you know um or want to be a part of that uh if you know that's true but the other aspect is when i understand that um the disenfranchisement what are some of the biggest struggles you think uh, we face today as black men? What will be your top three? I'm going to jump out there and I'm going to say financial. Fit in the description. We don't know as it is. We are so complacent in where we are. Like, a lot of kids that I was working with, I went to school with their parents. Right. Or their, their family members, their sisters or whatnot. We normally stay where we grew up, right? Mm -hmm. Like, even myself, I didn't get a passport until about three years ago. Mm -hmm. We don't go anywhere. People a lot, especially in this area, people from D.C., they stay in D.C. You know, within our communities, we stay where we are. So our exposure is limited, I feel like, sometimes. Mm -hmm. So it makes things a lot of difficult. So we only know what we see. And what we see is limited. Right. You can tie, of course, our psychological issues into that, some of the struggles we've been through. But definitely understanding our money and making our money work for us is very important. Mm -hmm. um, because I think we have a lot of pressures telling us how we should be, what we're supposed to be doing, what we're supposed to be wearing and what we're supposed to have to sort of show people who we are. And if we don't have those things, we feel some type of way about it. Mm -hmm. And so I think, um, like I said, gaining the understanding of that, understanding the real value lies not in these things, but in us having the ability to do what we want to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, taking that information, that knowledge, and sort of sharing that with those who uh, came after us just to make sure that they don't fall into some of those same traps. You know, black man, the black car, black tenant one is just like, oh, you look like the person. So as much as the person you pulled over is a well-educated black man, I'm working on doctors, serial entrepreneur, um, you know, have all these accolades and so forth, and that brand that people know me, but I still fit the description at the end of the day, to being an entrepreneur in, uh, you know, in South Carolina, 
where there's a cap for how high a black man can go in success. So no matter who I am and what I do as an entrepreneur to show that I am trying to bring jobs to my community, but there's still a ceiling because I'm black that I can't go farther than that. Mm -hmm. And if I try to go far, oh, we got to knock them down a little bit. Oh, we got to take some resources or you're not eligible for this or you can't get that resource. You can't get that line of credit. Like, you know, because of the whatever statistics. We was pitted against each other from the get-go. You know, the, the best and brightest was sought out and killed. You know, and reading was a crime. You yeah. know, they killed people if they know how to read. So you left with some of the most uneducated or whatever. You have to rebuild. And I think we still rebuilding, you know. Um, and I think even the ones who were it's not to say that they killed all the smart ones and just left a bunch of dummies or something, but the ones who were left behind, those who were educated, those who were smart enough to try to, you know, organize, um, you had enough of the others that didn't want to, um, you know, didn't want to test the waters, you know? Right. Like, Time changes everything. Mm -hmm. Time changes everything when it comes to the person that you want to be, the person that you inspire to be. Um, it's, it's just, it, it, it all changes. And, and, and we and we as black men tend to have to kind of just go along with it because not only are we behind financially, we're behind um, educationally, we're behind, we're pretty much behind in every facet, but we also have to be mindful of those things. Mm -hmm. So now, so it feels like we're super behind. Well, sometimes we're super behind. Like we can't certain, say that now. Yeah, like we can't, <laughs> we can't do this. We can't say that. You yeah. know, you know, yeah. there's so many things that you have to be mindful now, mm -hmm. and and that's and that's perfectly fine because you want to respect everybody's right. feelings and right. whatever they have to say. But at the same time, it's like there's so many things to consider, and and as, and that and that can be overwhelming. Yes, yeah, I do agree. I think we struggle to take our rightful place in our own families and our own communities. Mm -hmm. um, we live in a society, and it's particularly a community that is matriarchal driven. That's why when Big Mama died, the whole family unraveled. Right. But that's probably because the, the, the grandfather, the, the male in that case, didn't necessarily take his rightful place. And the males that he, that he bred, unfortunately, didn't take their rightful place. And so I think we're looking at multiple generations over where the man has been subjected to second or third place. Mm -hmm. And we know, for those of us that are believers, we know that the, the order of the family is God, the, 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 the male, then the, the wife, and then the children, mm -hmm. right? And so I think when that order is flipped, and we lose that perspective, yep. and everything is out of order. And then we find ourselves, you know, being just in a, in a very backward space. Mm -hmm. And we find the men just uh, lacking confidence, mm -hmm. lacking, uh, you know, assurity in terms of who he is, and in terms of having that power and to go out into, into his domain and, and, really, and really be confident in that space. So as black men, do you ever feel like you're someone you're not? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think even when it comes to things like, our outward appearance, like having a full beard and going into a job interview for a job that you really wanted. That that's that wasn't something that wasn't something we were able right. Right. to do at some point. Having ha having dreads was not something we were able to do, you know, walking into job interviews because we had to literally change our appearance mm -hmm. in order to satisfy what they feel like they need mm -hmm. from us. Mm -hmm. I can't like I've, I've had this, I've had a beard for seven or eight years now. I've, I've applied for jobs. It didn't deter me from from getting the job, so so I so I had to find out this was y'all's issue <laughs> in regards in regards to me having a beard or my boy having dreadlocks, right. uh, trying to get you know an accounting job. That was y'all's problem. That was y'all's issue. Mm -hmm. I'm going to continue to be me in regards to put on a put on a fly ass suit and have a full beard and do what I need to do to go to go get that job. Mm -hmm. And if you have a problem with it, then that's completely on you. Things that are foreign to you in terms of being applicable to you might not work because that's what they've learned and what they know. They make it right, but you don't know what my experience might have been with someone with a beard. Mm -hmm. And I'm the CEO. Mm -hmm. And I'm creating a company culture. Right. So you have to like think about it like that just as much as it's crazy to think about these little things cause such havoc, right. but we don't know what bred those experiences to be that outcome. Mm -hmm. So the same conviction that I think we gotta give to like, that's crazy in terms of taking that approach, we gotta think like, what we're called what caused that right. to fix that. Right. Your perception, it can be good. Mm -hmm. So it can be like a sense of like, I know you, we're family, or it could be, I know you, so I know how you are. So it could be a negative thing, like say, uh, interaction with a police officer, a black police officer, like I already know you, I know your type, I know how you are. Um, but I think for the most part, 
my experience has been positive. Right. So it's been a positive experience. I think um, a lot of times there's a lot of opportunities for us because uh, not saying that we're all the same, but a lot of, it's like some threads of like similarities between like our struggles, and so we can always relate on certain things. So I think I'm still learning uh, mm-hmm. because. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm 29 going on 30. I'm not married. I don't have kids, you know, so I think um, in my in, in my in my head, I'm still constantly learning in regards to what being a, being a black man in this environment looks like and feels like because it changes all the time. Right. What may what may be a good idea when I was 17, 18 years old right. may not be what is a good idea now, because even 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 something like a gay slur, which you Right. You know, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. even something as a gay slur wasn't a huge deal. Right. Now, when, like, now it's a now they are they will shut down, your whole, will shut down your whole social media yeah. presence if anything like that comes out of your mouth, and and that's what I'm saying is like and then with that particular group, I'm learning every day right. what's acceptable and not and not acceptable. Do you think uh, therapy is necessary for black men? Yes. 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 Uh, uh, so I. So I was on drugs really heavy um, through college um, up until about 22, 23. And then I was dipo- diagnosed with bipolar disorder about two years ago. Mm-hmm. So like, for, and, from, and from the outside looking in, um, it doesn't, it, you, you can never really tell. I do, I mean, I, I feel like I'm introverted, but I feel like I do well when I'm in a setting and, in, 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 you know, in, in settings. Like even even when I'm even when I met Hip even when I met uh, Dr. Pryor it was literally at a bar and he would know we were just happening to be hanging out yeah, yeah. and we realized we were both therapists and we were able to connect and talk and and then uh, when I started telling him that you know that I was going through all these things and I've dealt with these things he he couldn't believe it you know it was just one of those things where it's just like wow like that's very that's very you know that's very that's that's very deep that you that I never would have thought you a person like you would have been going like this. Because we're talking about, I graduated college, I got my master's, and I got my license as a therapist, all while all while completely strung out. Wow. You know, so it was so just so it was just one of those things where um, I I was constantly dealing with it, and of course you have your toxic relationships, you know, people that you're not supposed to be with, but you but you but you are with them, and you know, and things that are going on in your career. I've been fired a few times, so you know, and that that deals with your mental health because now you have to worry about how you're gonna pay your bills, right. and and if you're gonna be able to even get another job like that, you know. So it's always it's always something that we kind of as men we kind of um, especially black men we kind of cover up right. what the issues that, that we may be going through and we have to kind of just push along especially when we have people that are relying on us whether it be our kids our wives girlfriends whatever mm-hmm. we always kind of kind of just kind of pack out pack it up and just keep it moving no matter what it looks like so, who's the first per- person to break your heart and how did you deal with that heartbreak my father was the first person to break my heart and i didn't deal with it the right way i shut down completely and to this day i've started to seek like therapy but i'm still dealing with issues from that I'm trying to get better, but a lot of just I shut down. I keep to myself, or I go. I play soccer a lot. Okay. That's kind of like my uh, my therapy. Um, I was doing therapy for a little bit. Mm-hmm. When I get back into it, yeah. um, and also a little bit just challenging myself to be more open and honest when I'm feeling a certain way mm-hmm. with the people I love. To like kind of instead of holding that in, to communicate that with them. Okay. Um, so you say you shut down when all of a sudden that seemed to be your coping mechanism. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when you shut down, what happens? How like like describe that to me. Um, I just kind of like, you know, like the Homer Simpson meme where he kind of like fades into the, yeah, uh, yeah, into the bush. That's kind of what I do. I just kind of fade out of reality into my own mind. How does that help you when you are going through something? Um, because I can control everything that I'm thinking mm-hmm. with inside and um, just, I can just block it all out. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess it's something I've been doing as a child. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. I was, I was going to say my mother because I didn't meet her to a few years ago and I'm a grown adult now so like not being able to have that love or attention shown to me through parents, mm-hmm. I was never able to give that to someone else. Mm-hmm. So, learn that as I go. Been, been How do we deal with the disappointment of others as black men? People let you down. How do you deal with that? I mean, typically, sometimes we just project it on somebody else before we realize it, before we catch the impact that it had on us. You know, there's so many things that we don't understand and then you get into another relationship or friendship or whatever that dynamic is and they, they challenge you in a certain way um, and you just kind of go back to what's familiar that's probably what hurt you guys. Um, and then nobody, again, is teaching black men to say, I don't know if you don't think we have the patience, but how to deal with that in an emotionally responsible way. 
or the things that were modeled in front of us about how to handle it emotionally uh, isn't the right model that we should, you know, be following. I was told to bottle it up. Yeah, I, so that person shut him down. Trying to figure out you can't sustain relationships in the future, right. and you got to kind of go back and think about some of the things that may have hurt you in the past, and hope you catch before it's too late. How I how I deal with it today is the understanding that I'm not perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, so why should I expect perfection from somebody else? You know, I make mistakes. What have shortcomings? What is that, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I have flaws. This people that I have disappointed. People that I have betrayed, mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't intentional. <coughs> uh, so, if I encounter that today, 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 right, 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 um, right, right. then I have an understanding. Do you think black men who are viewed as vulnerable um, are weak men? No. 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 Okay. I appreciate the consensus. Quite the contrast. <laughs> Quite the contrast. I'm jealous. I'm jealous of that. I'm jealous of that. I'm jealous of that. <laughs> They're actually stronger than right. most of us who yeah. attempt to project this image of, of, of just, you know, 100% man, you know, saying so like you're invincible. You know, that's, 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 a, the, that's the weak person. Yeah, that's the weak person. So I'm, but you're so I'm clear. Just that so. goes back to your first question. What does manhood mean? Right. So if I'm clear, we, as black men, this collective group of black men, would agree that if you are weak or if you are vulnerable, you're not weak. You're actually the strongest mm -hmm. in terms of the way you are. Agreed. I had, to, I, had, I, had, I had to learn to cry. I had to learn to, when I was dealing with something, when I was dealing with whether it be my family, whether it be in a relationship, whether it be something frustrating happened at work, you know, I had to learn that that was okay. Mm -hmm. and, and, that's, and that's something as a, as a man, when you, when you look at other men or, or as you were growing up, that's not something that's there for you as far as, far as something that you learn. Like I had, I had to learn to be able to put it out there instead of constantly putting in, putting in, putting in, putting in, and not be able to deal with my emotions or my feelings the right way. So, and I think, let me cut you off. No, you're good. It's just, uh, and I think sometimes as men, it's like we, we have a knack for controlling our environment. Mm -hmm. So it's like, and I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you, her, you know, to, to say that, you know, you say you had a teach yourself to cry mm -hmm. you know i had to teach myself to cry from the others or to be open about how i truly feel and show the true authentic ricky to the public or in front of people because today knowing that if me and you gonna do business together you would never have saw this side of me because i don't want you to prejudge who i am based off a future business deal that we could do together and I think that's how it is with the world, you know, where it took a while for me to open up to my now wife because I didn't want her to judge me based off. See, it was weak. Yeah, exactly. I'm the opposite. I mean, if anything, I'm too vulnerable sometimes. Like, I'm, I put everything out there. I ain't did. Like, so that's how I always, I don't know where it came from. You know, it might have been because, you know, losing my mom at an early age, like, I had no choice really. But sometimes I bottle stuff up. I used to get in a lot of fights back then, you know, when I was younger and stuff. But, um, at the same time, I got no problem telling people, you know, <coughs> opening up to people at the same time. Or, um, and I think it's because I know that, well, I had to learn throughout time that other people are going through the same thing. So to tell someone else that you're going through something or to, to put it out there, you're going you're gonna to find that communion. You know what I'm saying? You're going to find out somebody else is going through the, the same process. Fast forward 20 years, what advice would you offer black men in the future about surviving while black in America? Money is going to be very important. So our economic sustainability. And set boundaries. To truly come to terms with how great and magnificent we are. Never let your guard down. It's okay to mingle and act like, you know, we can associate, we can have a good time. We can even have parties, whatever. You can have friends. By the end of the day, you still have to wake up and look yourself in the mirror and realize you're a black man. That it's always going to be different for you. No matter what people tell you, no matter how, they be like, oh man, it's okay. Da, da, da. No. Because you're a black guy. The world is against you. The world is against you. Right. They, they already made it clear. Mm -hmm. You know, you see it every day. Somebody getting shot down or somebody getting pulled over, arrested, harassed, whatever the case may be. So, where is it to think that it might not happen to you? You know what I'm saying? Like, it's unfortunate that 
It can happen to me. Yeah, you can have second, seconds. Any, any second, you know? Even if you say the wrong stuff at the wrong time or something like that. On both ends. Your own neighborhood or getting your pulled over. You feel what I'm saying? It's crazy. So we got all against us. So I just have to say, be on guard all the time. No matter what positivity I give them, no matter what motivation I give them, it's like I'm still setting you up for failure. Because it's still not enough. But I still want to tell you, no matter how much they knock you down, no matter how much you get bruised and how much they take away from you in the world, you know, whatever, still find a willpower. Stand up, get up, and still be the best representative that you can be as an African American male. I would say don't compromise. Don't settle. Be who you are. Be proud of who you are. Remember that people are watching. Remember that, that you're an ambassador for, for who we are as a people. Um, don't take that lightly. Don't overanalyze that and don't overthink it uh, because you need to be authentically you and you need to live your truths and live according to what drives you. But understand that there's more at stake than just you. You have a major responsibility in so many areas. One to pass down to the next generation for your family and even for yourself to know that we are more than what we're labeled as. Embrace that responsibility because if you don't embrace it, you won't give your true self to it. You always do what others say. Follow your dreams, never give up. Remember history, man. Um, history is important. All right, all right, gentlemen. That concludes our wrap up for the day as far as a collective. Um, this will be the first of many conversations to come, I promise you, but I just want to appreciate you all for your candor, your transparency, your vulnerability. Because if you don't realize you did that today, you did that. Um, and it started here. If this is the first time, take that walk with that. Because there's so much more you can do with that type of opening up to really see yourselves with who you should become. Listen to my words. Who you should become versus who you have decided to be. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So we're adjourned. Give yourself some round of applause.